This was a meetup event on June the 3rd, hosted by Agnostic Agile, with the speaker Antonio Cobo Cuenca on my journey discovering Agnostic Agile. The talk today, is, it's a little bit funny on this meetup because most of the time when I give this talk, I'm introducing Agnostic Agile to a lot of people that uh, they don't know it or never heard about it. But here is quite the opposite. So let's see how it goes and maybe uh, it's going to be useful for all of you. So as I was saying before, I was stretching a little bit because I'm afraid of public speaking, even though it's more than three years giving talks. So I was stretching because it's always good to have some kind of a, a stretch. And there is uh, one technique that they told me once. Imagine at the beginning that you're a superhero and make a superhero pose. So usually when I give this talk in person, I ask the whole audience to do the best superhero pose. So I am not going to be able to see all of you because I cannot see, I can see only my presentation, but try to imagine a good superhero pose, feel like a winner, breathe, and then we can continue. Usually I do that because my talks are usually the first one or second one after lunch break on conferences. So I don't want people to sleep. <laughs> so, okay, a couple of warnings for you. I'm from Spain. I have a really strong Spanish accent. I speak too fast and I'm uh, asthmatic. So hopefully it's going to be okay, but I prefer to tell you in advance in case you hear my breathing or if I'm uh, going really, really quick giving uh, the talk, just say something on the chat and Ivona will let me know, okay? And another warning, I'm gonna use a lot of exaggerations and my way of uh, speaking like a Mediterranean guy. So I, I'm not going to personally attack any of you on all of the moments that I'm gonna describe but it's just for sharing and to make a, a little bit more emphasis. So I'm not attacking any of you, but I'm gonna be a little bit uh, complaining about a lot of things during this talk, right? The talk today, so a quick definition of agnostic that uh, you've already covered a little bit, so it's going to be fast. And I, I'm gonna be focused a lot on my context before discovering agnostic agile how it was my um, my thinking, how I was feeling, and the events in my life that uh, arrived before uh, discovering Agnostic Agile. And then I'm gonna review the 12 principle with uh, all of you that probably you already know them, but on some of them I'm gonna share with you a small uh, stories in my life of things that happened and I, I didn't understand why people were really, really not following the principles because for me it's common sense. But someone told me common sense is actually the least common of the senses, right? Definition of agnostic. So you can see that it's uh, on the website and it's a link to tech target. It's referring to something that is generalized. So interoperable among various systems. So that it can be not only for software and hardware, but also business processes or practices. And that's the, the thing for me that it resonates a lot because when we want to know what is agnostic agile, it's agility adapted to within given system according to context. And it's not a prescription of any particular framework or method. That it was probably one of my um, triggers at that time before uh, discovering Agnostic Agile. A lot of people prescribing one framework and not the others. When I share this definition with a lot of people, especially when they don't know about Agnostic Agile, they always ask me, isn't that exactly what Agile is or it's supposed to be? And <clears throat> in, a sense, in, in essence, yes. And I'm pretty sure what the creators of the Agile Manifesto, they were thinking it was something similar to that. But there is something that happened to Agile in the last years. Any guess about what happened to Agile? So and if there is any answer on the chat, you can let me know, Ivona. 
sometimes I have funny answers on, on some talks. <laughs> what I think that uh, happened exactly to Agile, and that's um, changing the meaning of Agile for me, it's money. In some uh, areas or some companies, there's a monetization of Agile, and it's becoming a business, using Agile as a business and not to improve. And I have some examples that I will share with you, but uh, and it's I have seen a lot of uh, uh, companies trying to apply the same framework, the same uh, steps, the same process to uh, different customers without checking why that customer is important. Like trying to use one size that fits all of them, and of course it's not. There are a lot of failed. Agile transformation, a lot of um, failed applications of Agile because we don't try to understand the different team. And then when I was at that moment in my life, I saw a lot of examples like that. A lot of companies trying to do the same. A lot of Agile coaches applying always the same on two different companies or three without adapting everything. And that, it was really, really complicated for me. So a little bit about myself, my, about my context, because maybe you didn't experience something like that, but for you to understand a little bit about myself, I'm from Spain. I have lived around nearly 10 years in France and now six years here in UK. I started as a software developer and now I'm delivery manager, it's my role title, but all the engagements with the clients is more about agile coaching and sometimes um, I start uh, being a scrum master, they had a new scrum master, I teach the scrum master uh, how to help the team, how to become a scrum master, and then I do the same to a different team. You can see the different uh, companies that I work for, travel, um, and a lot of uh, consultancies at them working with uh, retail businesses and uh, banks lately. So I have something for you to think what it is. Time plus money plus sometimes an exam. Do you know what it is? And if you have any guess on the chat, I'm more than happy if you want to tell me the, uh, the guess. <laughs> Uh, it's fake agile. Fake agile? Well, that's certification, fun. paper certified. Cool. So whoever said certification is exactly what I was meaning. And it's at that moment of my life, I I got a certification uh, a CSM, certified scrum master. I enjoyed the two days course. My trainer, it was amazing. I learned a lot and I could feel in how passionate he was. My company at that moment paid some money and there was one exam. But to be honest, that exam, um, it wasn't complicated. For that uh, um, company issuing the certification, you had uh, three or four uh, tries and on the first one I did it, while I was working with my boss asking me questions and trying to see if I could pause the exam and resume the exam, and you can, and actually they don't change the questions. So you can get the certifications just Googling and that's all. Doesn't feel right. I have another certification that is certified as Scrum Product Owner. And I've never been a product owner in my life, which is a little bit weird, right? How can I be certified on something that I've never been, I've never worked for? And on that certification, you don't have exam, at least for that company. You only need it two days of your life, someone to pay money, whether it's you or the company. And on those two days, not everybody was interacting with the rest of the people. And after those two days, they were certified as Scrum Product Company. Doesn't feel right. And I wasn't feeling 
that it was right. It was money all about. It was some pyramidal scheme, to be honest. Well, it was my feeling. I'm not saying with this that all certifications are bad. Um, you can learn a lot. There are another kind of certifications that are more based also on the experience. It's a long process, and you can show that uh, you have the knowledge and you know how to apply. But there are some certifications that actually, if you pay, you get it. And that's all. And then you have people with those newly certified that um, I am now certified as master and I can be a scam master on it for all of you without any experience. Same you have some companies that are looking for scam masters and they don't check the experience. They only want to see whether you have a certification or not, which is wrong, right? At that time, I was a little bit active on LinkedIn. And I got really tired of all the fights within all the framework practitioners. Usually the people, uh, there's a scam versus scam ban, a lot of bashing against safe, even uh, against list. I haven't worked on a safe environment and I don't know a lot about safe. So I cannot actually have an opinion about safe. So I'm not going to criticize or to say bad things about safe because I've never used it. But I've seen a lot of people without any experience using safe just criticizing. Same for other frameworks. I've also seen a lot of people saying all the time, that's not agile. And for me, the feeling is not whether you are or you aren't agile. For me, the real question is if you are more agile than before, if you're improving. So for me, agile is not a Boolean value. It's not a one zero, whether you are or not. It's like a gray scale. Not this one, because it's Game of Thrones. And it's uh, one of the things that I do on talks. I put pictures of geek things from time to time. This is agile for me. It's a gray scale. You can check whether you are more or less, less or more, whenever you want to check which one is agile or not agile. Um, the key thing is if you're improving. And that was my feeling at that time. And I wasn't able to see a lot of people with that message, with all that fight between frameworks. A lot of people on LinkedIn just making controversial content just to get more likes and more hits and more comments. I started going to a lot of meetups because I changed the company. It wasn't a company that was based in London instead of in, in Sarbiton, where I was uh, before. So I wanted to learn from others. I wanted to hear experience from others. I started going to a lot of different meetups at that time. And one of those is actually this meetup when it was a Digital Project Managers London before, or London Digital Project Managers. I always get the, the name uh, wrong. I want to one of those uh, talks. And it's when I discovered, well, when I started my journey discovering Agnostic Agile. It was a meetup about Agile and project management. And the speaker was uh, giving the talk, explaining, and there was one guy all the time interrupting him, saying, no, but that's not Agile, that's not Agile. And actually, he was meaning all the time, that's not Scrum because that's not in the scam guide. No, that's not in the books about the scam. No, that's, it cannot be agile because it's not in the scam guide. So I wasn't a little bit angry with that guy, but uh, finally he stopped interrupting. But that speaker was really calm all the time. And honestly, I don't know if at that point of my life, <laughs> four years ago, I think it was, I don't remember now, if I would have been that calm. Now, yes, probably, because I'm probably, now that I'm a dad, I'm calmer. <laughs> but 
But uh, I remember his pragmatic approach explaining about agile and project management. So I follow a little bit more uh, that meetup group, and they they, they had uh, one Slack. So I joined the Slack. It was a uh, just when I discovered at the same time Slack at that moment when I changed the company. The company was working for the use Slack a lot. In this meetup, they said that they have a, um, a Slack, and I said, well, why not? And it wasn't a lot of movement, but they announced there, even before on the meetup group, that there was something called Agnostic Agile. You go, oh. So I check it. I check it, and I wrote a lot. And I was, wow, it's more or less all my, all, all my feelings about Agile, about all the problems that I'm seeing in all meetups and LinkedIn. That's interesting, and it was like a, a weird feeling. So I signed, and probably if you check the website, I think I'm I'm on the first ten people who signed, knowing that the first four or five, the first four or three, I don't remember, are the creators of uh, Agnostic Ideas. I'm one of the first one because I was that on that Slack. But I have to say that when I started reading, I was a little bit worried about all the things that I didn't want it to be. And I was happy when I could check that it's not another framework, because I was worried that, OK, another framework, and it's going to be more and more walls between frameworks. But it's not. My second suspicion, OK, let's check when they are going to start asking about money and certification. And it's not. So I was really, really happy. So no certifications, not asking for my money. And it's all compendium of uh, my feelings with the principles. So I signed. And then the 12 principles. Probably you already know all because you are on this group. And uh, it's going to be easier to share why I think it's important. And the key thing for me sometimes is when you read the 12 principles, that it's really common sense. We can have a different vision, each of us, about why this specific principle is important than other. And maybe it's not going to be the same degree of importance than you, but that's the beauty of it for me. Because we can experience the 12 principles in different ways and realizing why we need to adapt. At the first one, I'm, I could stop here and say, this is the main thing, is to put my customer first and making them independent. I saw a lot of uh, companies forcing the use of one framework just because they don't know the other. So instead of advising someone who can actually help that customer with that context, no, they try, they go there, they try to force a different framework just to get money. So you're not putting your customer. I always think that if you know someone who can do it better than you and can give a better service for your customer, I, I say that to my customer. Someone who was a long time ago, I wasn't really, really good with, uh, or with a lot of experience about uh, multiple groups uh, and scaling agile. So I did say to one uh, to of the customers, actually, I'm, uh, we're not uh, that good on that. We can try to help you and going with you on that uh, journey. But probably you would need someone else that is going to be more expert. I heard of these two uh, different consultants uh, with two different agile coaches that they can help you better that we can. And we were a link to those people. So the client went with them. But after, we got a lot of uh, leads to get more clients because the first customer was really impressed that we admitted that uh, someone else could be better, and we actually pointed to the right direction. So you put your customer first, you always get better feedback. If you don't try to implement the same to all of them, 
they will understand that you're getting the context and you're understanding why it's important for them to do one thing in a way and not in another, on another. So you can understand and try to get with them how to improve. That sometimes is complicated for me to do my best complementing theory with practical experience. I'm more like a trying thing. No, I prefer to, okay, let's try it, let's try it. And sometimes I'm lacking some sentence of the theory that is interesting. But I'm always trying to, okay, let's try this and we do it. I know that I can go, I need to get better on theory, but it's also, other people or other consultants that I've seen, they are too uh, focused on the theory or what is writing on the books and they don't have the experience. So they are advising what the book says and not uh, analyzing the, in the context. Sorry, my asthma, I need to drink a little bit. Tailor agility to context. So in order to explain why it's important that to me, it's a situation on a meetup. When I went, it was meetup on, it was um, a medium sized financial company. It was organizing a meetup for one of the agile groups. I'm not going to say which one. I was a, a head of agile transformation that uh, in, that person was uh, brought from US for a, a long contract to actually perform the gel transformation and make a gel. So was given the talk about uh, the process. I was one thing that it was really, really triggering me. Once I was explaining, first thing I did when I joined this company was to force everybody, even marketing and sales to use the scam. I always do that on every company I work for because I want everybody to know what Agile is. And it was for me a shock. So they are bringing someone with a lot of experience on transformations. And the first thing that uh, that person is doing without even asking about the context of the company is let's force everybody to use a scan with the excuse of knowing what Agile is. Well, maybe they will know what Scrum is or what the theory of a Scrum is but it's not going to help. And on that meetup, there was a second talk of someone of the same company from marketing. That it was how I failed trying to implement a Scrum for marketing. So it was quite fun. She's saying that the, that's the, <laughs> the way that uh, she does to help everybody to know what Agile is. And someone says, and, no, finally we couldn't do anything with marketing because they feel that we forced the change and that they were an owning the change and it was something that, uh, okay, she's coming from a different company and is applying that without even trying to understand that. And that's probably one of the things that I try to do with every team, every portfolio, even within the same company, every different client is to understand the context. We cannot do exactly the same to two different teams. Even for the same team, two years after with the same people, they are not the same. They are two years more experience. The company has changed. You need to understand the context again. So don't try to apply always the same thing. That for me is uh, to understand the constraints and, and, and work to remove them. The way that I, this helped me is sometimes my first year uh, my first year as Scrum Master, remember with um, the certification, they were always saying, you need to remove blockers. You need to remove blockers. If you are so focused on removing blockers, sometimes you're not understanding another con constraints that uh, you are not trying to see. And you need to, to remove them with other teams at the same time. So it's a little bit more of collaboration. And sometimes you need to adapt and realize that you cannot remove every blocker at once. You need to go one by one, trying to understand which one is the most impactful and easy to remove, and trying to find the balance and going one by one. 
but you need to try to understand, talk to people, find why this is happening like that, why they don't do in a different way. To share, learn, and improve. When I was permanent for different companies, I had a lot of um, issues with uh, people not uh, sharing anything. And uh, when you were coming, can you explain me how you are doing that so my team can actually do it? And they weren't sharing. So I had to to try to learn myself without sharing. When I was attending meetups, I could see that people were sharing and learning a lot. So I'm doing that the same. And improving is probably my driver even for conference speaking. I'm always trying to be a better version of myself every day. I'm trying to be a better version of Antonio from yesterday. Some days probably I achieve that, maybe others no, but it's my my goal. And when we try to improve and to learn, I'm always um, telling myself going small, small improvement now, it's better than delayed perfection. And I have to explain that to a lot of teams when I'm with them, when I'm the Scrum Master, when I'm coaching them. Don't try to do the perfect right now. Just do a small improvement. One of the key things for me sometimes is perfection is actually the enemy of great. If you don't release things till they are perfect, if you don't change things because they are not going to be perfect, you are missing the possibility of releasing great things, but to doing great improvements for the team. And every small improvement, it's a step towards a better way to do things. That's the reason when I'm working with uh, metrics, now I'm working with my current client on putting some metrics. And one of the reports that I like the most is uh, trends over time for the teams that you can see where they are improving on the metrics that we have. And if there is a, one event when actually they start the coaching and you can see that the metrics, uh, they are showing a small improvement every day, every day, every day. And you, you compare the metrics today from when they were three months ago, there's a massive improvement because it was a small improvement every day. Respect. And that is everybody. You need to respect everybody, especially with uh, all the differences. I think it's uh, you need to respect the differences in people. And the same with frameworks and practitioners. I don't know a lot about other frameworks, but I respect them. I can understand when someone prefers to use one framework instead of another because they have more experience, because for the context is better. But always with the respect as a as a goal and as a day-to-day -day way of doing things. I I really don't like people talking bad about others. And yeah, I'm, I'm trying to avoid that. If, Especially the, some really bad comments on LinkedIn at that time when I discovered Agnostic Agile, and it was really completely disrespectful. And I think we need to to always interact with people in, in a respectful uh, way. I managed to do that uh, now better than before. I, I don't answer emails straight away if I feel that uh, I might not be respectful with my answer. I, I cool down and things like that. And when I need to answer this straight away with my voice, I'm always trying to get at least 10 seconds of breathing to ensure that I'm doing in a way more respectful. And at the end is respect other frameworks and the dictionaries as a, the way that you would want them to respect you, right? Unknowns and seeking help. That's one of the things that uh, when I'm discussing with other people from my company or from my previous one, at the, working for a consultancy, sometimes in, when you don't have a lot of experience as a consultant, you are afraid of saying that you don't know anything because 
you are supposed to be the consultant, the expert that knows everything. So a lot of people end up not uh, acknowledging that they don't know anything, they don't seek for help. That can lead to, over time, really bad uh, for your mental health. And uh, it will uh, end up also misleading and misrepresenting information with the customer, which is one of the key things for me is, uh, I don't know, but I will try to help you finding the answer is a perfect valid answer even if you're a consultant, or even if you are brought like a, an expert on a subject matter. I respect more people when they say, no, I don't know, than when they try to answer something that is clearly wrong. If you don't acknowledge that you don't know, you to start misleading or misrepresenting information, you are not helping your customer. Remember the first, it's really, really key to use the transparency. And it's um, when I'm explaining with some teams why it's important transparency, especially with uh, some developers that they, they don't have trust uh, on business people or to business people that they don't trust developers. When they manage to do in a way that is transparent what we're doing, what we know, what we don't know, it's easier because no one is going to try to check on you about what you are doing because they know what you are doing all the time. And that's the reason displaying the information as it is, is a powerful tool. And I, I love to try to have dashboards everywhere or so in the, the status of every backlog or every sprint or every Kanban board everywhere like that anyone can see. If you're transparent with your job, you have the trust of the rest of the people because they know exactly what you're doing all the time. And if you have the trust, you have the autonomy to actually work in a way that you are going to ensure you're improving every day, your team is improving every day, and you're delivering more value. And that's how I see those two principles linked. Principle number nine, that's uh, agility is not the end goal. I have seen a lot of uh, companies saying that we are agile, yay! as a marketing tool to recruit people. Yeah, we do stand-ups and, and that's all, but we are agile, so we can put on our, our job descriptions that is a agile environment, like that we can have more uh, developers applying. Or someone arriving, let's do an agile transformation, change the business, and, and so on, so we can do an agile transformation and being agile. Yeah, that's good, but what's the, what's the goal? What do you try to achieve doing that? Because if you only want to be agile without any reason, it's not going to work. You need to find whether you want to reduce the time that you're getting a new functionality to the market, or uh, in a way that uh, your developers are not leaving the company that quick. So it could be a way that uh, using agile to get people working on a sustainable pace so they can actually stay and get more engaged with your company. So that's a goal. But yes, we are agile for the sake of being agile. That's not the end goal. If we apply agile principles and we try to follow a couple of frameworks, customize one, and change the way of working, it's not for being agile. It's to actually do something else, right? And sometimes, if you're a consultant, you need to remember that to the client as well. The transforming teams or saying that you are agile because it's your goal without a real reason behind, it's not going to work. Especially in some industries that have worked in the past, the, the MDs and the VPs, the, the managing directors or vice presidents, every two years they're leaving and going to a different company in the same um, industry, then uh, two years after a different company, two years after a different, and then come back, and they apply the same. And there are some that are doing agile transformation without any reason, and they don't see actually the results, and they change the company. 
So they say, I apply in Agile Transformation for this company X, and now I'm working company Y, without stating what was achieved, right? Dogmatism is not, it's not Agile. I've met one amazing conference speaker that I enjoy his talk a lot. And I'm connected with him on LinkedIn. And I'm putting him as a, an example without mentioning. LinkedIn, he put this phrase, Scrum is the only sensible way of developing a new product. Uh, not really. For me, it's, Scrum is one of the sensible ways of developing a new product. That would be the real phrase. And why I tilt too much on this phrase? It's because the job title of that person certified the Scrum trainer. Probably it's a coincidence and it's me that uh, I'm always thinking bad. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that maybe if he would be a, cam a certified common trainer and not a Scrum trainer, they would still say something like the Scrum is the only sensible way of developing a new product. But that kind of dogmatism is not good. It's not good for Agile in general. It's not good for the business. And it's in a way that you are acknowledging, you're not acknowledging that there are different ways of doing it. And I love Scrum. I'm not against Scrum, even though I'm, I was complaining about Scrum Master certifications, Scrum Protocol certifications, now what one trainer. It's only that this kind of sentence is really misleading and it's not helping your customers either. That I have a good example for this one, recognizing that it's more to agile than agile. This is a situation of one company, a real one. They had five weeks of sprint. So not two weeks, not one, not four. Every sprint, it was five weeks. The four teams performing the stand-up together, all together. Only Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, stand-up. It was a big physical board with all the tickets of the four teams together, around 25 people. And they were able to release to a staging environment only at, at the end of those five weeks of sprint. So now, a question for all of you. Is that a yield? Do you have any answer, Ivona? Uh, no, we don't have currently. Oh, let me check. How many changes occurred? Yeah, so the key thing is, as I was saying, it's not whether this is agile or not, it's how they were working before. So, oh, sorry. It was like that. Before that implementation that changed in the ways of working, they were releasing every six, seven months when they were lucky. The release to staging, it was after six, seven months. They had one month or more of fixing bugs. The teams, they weren't talking to each other. That explained why it was one month or more fixing bugs. And there were no stand-ups or boards. When a client was arriving on the month five or six of that uh, version, they said, I want this development, and I will pay this. But I cannot wait nine or 10 months for that. It has to be on this release. So of course, that functionality was added to the release, and it was always del delayed. With the change of five weeks, for the clients, it was easy. If it's top priority, it will be on the following sprint, which is mean maximum six, seven weeks to get it, because sometimes they were modifying things. They had every five weeks a minor release in the staging and then in production. So they have predictability. The customers were actually seeing the new improvements more often 
for the teams, it was better because they knew exactly what the other teams were doing. And they were talking to each other. And everybody in the company could go to the massive board and see what was happening, what it was in progress, what was validating, or what was done. It was a massive change. So as always, you need to understand the context of the current situation and how they were before. And it's not about being or not being agile. It's are they improving or not? When you see only the five weeks sprint without any other context, some people say that's not agile. But actually, it's more agile than the initial state. So it was a massive change for that company, and it was a big step toward getting better. Then the last principle is one of the reasons I decided to share my experience with others and to try to, to give us, as I got for the, from the community, I've learned a lot on meetups or conferences. And sometimes it's not, it's not about the message that the conference uh, speaker is giving or the, on the meetup. Sometimes it makes me think something different the next day, and maybe to have a different idea after someone else share with me his, day to, his or her day to day, their challenges, how they overcome them or not, and how they think about a, overcoming a challenge. So that's the reason I'm giving talks and trying to share why it's important for me, agnostic, agile, why it's important every principle. Some examples of bad things or good things. And I hope that it's, uh, it's something that uh, can motivate more people to, to give talks as well. If I would need to, um, to do a short version of why it's important or what uh, agnostic agile made me think I, it could be probably three or four things. So don't try to lock the company customer or your team in one framework. I always try to understand how people are working and I try to adapt my ways of working as a Scrum Master, Agile Coach, or Facilitator to them, like that I can try to work with them to find the, the real and the good solution for them. Always try to improve and try to get to be a better version of yourself. You need to adapt. The context on companies is really complicated. The client I'm working now is a really, really big company with people around the world. So it's you need to adapt and inspect and improve with different teams, even within the same company, because they work differently. Their context is not the same. Share knowledge and learn from others. I always thought that if you know a lot of things but you don't share with anybody, it's a pity because the day that you won't be here, all that knowledge is lost. If you share the knowledge, it's like a, a little bit of yourself it's on each of us. And that's the reason I want to share the little knowledge I have and I'm trying to learn from others. It's a feeling like, a, I don't know, more community and I'm part of everybody else and everybody else is part of me. And it's okay to have a known and for help. I don't know is a perfect valid answer. That for me, it's more or less the four key messages that I, motivated me when I joined Agnostic Agile. And most of the time when I'm giving this talk, it's about getting one or two people to go to the website and, and read the, <laughs> the principles. And from time to time, I get even people uh, signing, which is great. Here, it's a little bit different. So I hope this is useful for, for all of you, how I arrived to discover Agnostic Agile, 
the change that it uh, make on me, how I'm trying to be more respectful, how I'm trying to learn from others, and trying to adapt all the time. So hopefully uh, it was useful, and I'm always open for feedback. Yes, uh, I send me an email, tweet, even though in the last two or three days all the tweets are not about Agile because political in the world, but I will go back to Agile in two or three days again on my tweet. And send me a, a LinkedIn request and uh, tell me that it's from here, especially if your role title is recruiter, you need to send me a message about why I should join. <laughs> Thank you.